Welcome to the Plumes of Oz, where today we're going to look at one of the long-necked waders, the herons. Not all long-necked waders are herons. We have cranes, storks, bitterns and egrets. The length of the neck of these long-necked waders can vary, even within the heron family. But the herons are easy to recognise in flight, for the herons fly with their neck retracted. Now I mentioned egrets, and we will cover these in another video. But for all purposes, egrets differ from herons only in that they are white. So it's a nomenclature name variation. And the family for the herons, bitterns and egrets is Ardeidae. At this billabong in central Queensland, hidden in the canopy of this tree that overhangs the billabong, there is a tan colour. This is the night heron. And as you can see, difficult to find. But now and again, when they're in breeding mode or the young birds are out waiting for a feed from the adult, they will come out and reveal themselves. Like this immature night heron. They are called night herons, for they feed at night time. Also, often called the Nankeen night heron because of the yellow legs. Here is the classical adult, a smooth tan and white bird with a black cap. Spot and striations imply immaturity. The colour of a night heron and its markings will often vary with age and whether the bird is in molt. And like many avian species, when the birds are young or immature, they will have spots or striations, and maybe variations in colour. See how dark the wing of this bird is, and there are striations going over the pale belly. This is an immature bird. And now the adult, with a very pale underbelly, with a rufous gradient coming down from the throat to the belly. An immature bird with mottling on the wings. The colour yellow is often found in herons, in the legs and the iris of the bird. This yellow colour is often referred to as Nanking after the Nanking dyers of cloth in China. With maturity, these birds will often develop a plumage coming from the nape of the neck called the nuchal plumage, but with molt, this plumage is lost. The juvenile night heron is very striated. Its black cap is more grey and also still striated. But the legs, instead of being yellow, go more to a greenish tinge. The Nanking dyers of China were particularly renowned for making yellow trousers. And the Nanking word has really been dropped from the Australian night heron because its legs and bill can adopt this slight greenish tinge. This night heron has been making its way down to the water. It's a little immature, a little bit of striation over the front of the chest. As mentioned, night herons feed at night, so it's most unusual to see them moving down to the water like this during the day. And the reason for it is that these young birds come down to fish during the day. And I suspect their night vision is a little bit slower to develop. Without catching any fish, this young, immature night heron returned back up to a roosting site. In this video, time is compressed to one-sixth, for these birds are slow movers. When he finally got up into the roosting site, you can see him there with his striations, and standing next to him is an adult bird that lacks the striations. And then there is another adult bird, a little further away. Male and female are sexually isomorphic. But here is a young, juvenile bird getting back up into the roosting site after an unsuccessful daytime fishing expedition. Previously I mentioned that the neck of a heron can vary in its length, and the night heron has a neck length of approximately equivalent length to the body, and the legs of a night heron also aren't very long. So the night heron is one of the small type herons we have in Australia. Can you see the long-necked heron here? It's roosting, up on top of a dead limb, 
and this heron watching like this is a typical feature of the Australian waterways that contain fish and invertebrates. The only place that herons are absent in Australia is in the desert areas where the waters dry up too quickly for the fish to develop. This heron is called the white faced heron and the legs are just about the same length as his neck which is about the same length as his body. The wings are very large and herons are excellent flyers and they are also flock birds and here at Hexham Wetlands a group of white faced herons feeding together. In flight you can see their necks all retract and they often fly in unison going from one feeding site to the next. The flock behaviour of these birds is not fixed, it is very loose and sometimes you will find a single bird and at other times a flock like this of 30 or so birds. In flight they will often extend their necks, particularly in a mating mood where two birds, presumably a pair, are flying together. Here another behavioural shot of the white-faced heron feeding as a group. Now look at this bird. This one has reddish legs. And here it is, coming down. The white face is very white, contrasting against the grey of the bird. The bill has gone very dark and in a non-breeding bird it is usually pale at the base so this bird is in breeding mode. The eye and the plumage has also darkened. Another white faced heron with slightly different plumage. The plumes are developing over the back and also on the neck. Look at the lower part of the neck and look at the way the plumes drop down. The legs are yellow, the bill is dark. When you see plumage like this over the back and on the chest, the implication is that it's close to breeding. We can have different morphology in herons, sometimes dark, sometimes light. Look at this white-faced heron, a sooty colour, very dark. It is in breeding mode with a dark bill. But on this occasion the legs haven't gone to an orange colour, they remain yellow. A dark bird like this, it's tempting to say that this is a different morphology. But no, this is just an accentuated colour change with breeding. Here again, the typical mature white-faced heron. The streamer effect on the wing, the rufous plumes coming down from the neck onto the chest, with increasing white contrast of the face and the darkening of the bill. Herons are wetland birds, feeding visually on the foreshore or in the water shallows. They are opportunistic feeders and in the shallows their main diet is fish, then other invertebrates and amphibians. Foraging extends beyond the wetland to the surrounding grassed areas. Herons stalk their prey. Occasionally they will stir up the mud, hoping the invertebrates will come up to the surface where they can plunge at them and the final capture is done by vision. Their bill is very much like a harpoon, but they don't spear the fish, they just take it in the bill. If they swallow the fish the wrong way, it can have penetrating, disastrous effects. Picking out a young or an immature white-faced heron is not always easy, but here on this post the foreground bird has a less demarcated contrasting white face. The two adults are behind the young one. It is unusual to see non-reef herons feeding at the ocean. 
but it does happen now and again. And in this rock pool, trying to catch fish is an immature white-faced heron. No adult plumage. See on the face, the white doesn't have the sharp contrasting edge. The immature birds have more of a faded grey to white. Again, in a billabong, a young bird, the white and grey of the face do not have that sharp demarcation. Another feature of the young bird here is that the rufous colour is persisting over the back. Well, I've mentioned that the diet is fish, amphibians, invertebrates, but coming up onto the grassland area, insects here are the dominant food that these birds will eat. Well, leaving a long-legged heron, we're now going to go to a short-legged heron, and it does look as though this bird's got a short neck, but it does extend, and it is approximately the same length as the body. This is one of my favourites. It's a striated heron. There are two morphologies of the eastern striated heron, this one that is rufous and another one to the north that is grey. We will begin first with the rufous morph. This is found in the mangroves of the east coast of Australia and so extends from the tropics all the way down to Victoria. Striated herons have a fairly wide distribution throughout the world, mostly in the southern hemisphere, crossing over southeast Asia and southern Asia. So the subspecies are named more geographically, but they all have slightly different colour. In Australia, we have two subspecies, one on the west and one on the east coast. This striated heron will feed on fish that are caught in little pools, but mostly it feeds on crustaceans. Look at the way this bird stalks its prey, a little bit of movement in the mud, and there, a shrimp. The binomial name for the striated heron is Butterides striata. The butt from bitten and oides from resembling, so these birds resemble bitterns. In flight they have the low flying motion of most herons, over water, fairly low down. But the thing about them is that their legs don't trail far behind, they are short legs, so relatively easy to identify. In this rather slow motion clip, watch as the bird pulls its head in during flight typical of a heron. Another feature of the striated heron is that when it's wandering about it has a downward flick of its tail. This is in contrast to the Rallidae that have an upward flick. Most herons roost in trees, even more so with the short-legged herons, as we saw with the night heron. And this short-legged striated heron is very similar, camouflaging itself as it roosts in canopy. This striated heron was extremely difficult to find, but when he flew off, I've just got that last glimpse. Well now we're going to leave the rufous morphed striated heron and head into North Queensland, and as we head along the estuaries, there we can find this little beauty, the grey morphed striated heron. Notice again the typical heron features, the black cap, the yellow iris, the yellow legs. Previously we saw the striated heron stalking along the shoreline. But up in these mangrove areas, they are more likely to sit on a perch close to water, gazing into the water and catch fish. While up in the estuarine areas of tropical North Queensland, we are going to follow a call that sounds like a cow in labour. And here it is, pruning. This is the great billed heron. Unfortunately, I can only film this from a boat. The binomial name, Adia Sumatrana, 
indicates that this bird is mostly found in Indonesia. It is also in PNG and is found only in the northern tropical coast of Australia, usually in the estuarine areas. I have never seen it as a flock or a group, only ever as a single bird. And though it has been reported of breeding in Australia, I suspect the greater majority that we see are migratory birds. This is the biggest of the herons and has the largest bill. See the typical S bend of a heron neck? They have elongated cervical vertebrae. In addition, the vertebral bodies have more flexibility, in particular at the C5 level. With the large bill, you may think it's a stork. And though a stork can have a bend in its neck, it never has an S bend, just a single parabolic curve. The Australian black neck stork, with a single curve to its neck, and when the neck is straight, it is always smooth, whereas herons and egrets, with their serpentine neck, always have a notch in their neck. At C5, where the cervical vertebrate is extra elongated. And storks fly with their neck extended. Another heron with spots going up and down the white neck. Yellow eye, but the legs are dark. And its name is Ardea Pacifica, suggesting that it's found in the Australasian Pacific region. True, and it only breeds in Australia, sometimes migrating to PNG. Within Australia it is very mobile, moving to where the rain has fallen, and it only breeds after good rainfall. Look at that white neck. Its common name is white necked heron. This one doesn't have any black spots or grey on the side. And look at that breeding plumage. This is an adult breeding bird. Herons generally fly with their neck pulled in. The exception to the rule is at takeoff, it's extended for a short period, then withdrawn. And the other exception is on landing. They do this so they can rotate their head. The neck is extended, the head rotates, and they can look down to see where they will land. In flight, the white necked heron has two white spots on the shoulders making it easy to identify as it flies. Look at that beautiful serpentine neck of this white-necked heron. The S-bend also helps it catch a small fish like that. The elongated C5 vertebral body acts like a spear thrower to help project the bird's head. And the indigenous of Australia developed the Woomera from this thought, making a spear thrower called the Woomera, working much like the C5 vertebral body of a heron neck. The white-necked heron can extend its neck to a greater length than its own body. And the latter of black spots on the neck of this bird are grey, not black. The more grey and the more lateral they are implies a younger bird. An older bird will just have black spots and they are centralised anteriorly. Then a mature breeding bird will have no spots and just the white neck. And as with most herons, the male and the female are difficult to tell apart, the male only being slightly bigger. Herons have erectile feathers from the scalp running down over the neck. Did you see that? They really fluffed out. They usually do this when they are getting a little bit anxious about another bird being too close or a raptor or some other bird startling them. Here, you will notice the ducks. They will fly off soon, probably because the photographer is too close. And the heron gets alarmed. See the erectile feathers come out? And then he takes off. White-necked herons are wetland birds, preferring shallow water so they can see the fish. But wetlands abound in other invertebrates. And just like the other herons, the white-necked heron is opportunistic in its feeding. They will also go up into grasslands. And here you can see they eat insects as well. Here it looks like a family group with two adults and two young white-necked herons. The flock structure of the white-necked herons is similar to the white-faced, a loose cohesive relationship. More often they are found as individual birds. In the tropical areas of Australia, after the monsoonal rains, the billabongs gradually dry out. This traps the fish and these billabongs become a feeding frenzy for herons. This heron with a dark grey and white is called the pied heron. 
And here the adults are the very sooty grey, whereas the immature birds are more of a lighter grey with a little bit of rufous thrown into the colour. Once again, these birds have a yellow eye and yellow legs. Here at a drying out billabong, there are adults and juveniles. I'm not too sure of the structure of this group, but it's obviously a little bit more than a family group. And being a good feeding site, there are also white-necked herons and egrets present. One of the tricks of long-necked waders feeding on fish is flapping their wings to disturb the fish. The movement allows a flash of light on the silver scales, hence an easier catch. But this is the only time I've ever seen a heron feeding on the fly. The first bird was a white-necked heron, and then the pied heron, the adult, followed. The adults are separated from the young birds because they have a very dark cap which is sooty. The young birds have a pale motley cap. The adults also have a nuchal streamer, a sooty grey extended plume coming from the back of the head. Pied herons being in the tropics have to be careful of estuarine crocodiles. This bird was seen on one side and then the other. He flew over giving the crocodile a wide berth. A few moments ago we watched the pied heron fishing as the billabong dried out. It's often said that the pied heron eats more insects than invertebrates or fish. Here I watched them for quite a while without any luck in catching fish. This pied heron has a nice nuchal streamer and over the sooty coloured wings you can see the plumed feathers. And you can see why the word nankeen, often used for the night heron, isn't used that often nowadays, for these birds also have yellow legs, and the nankeen night heron was called nankeen because it had yellow-like trousers, but then so did the other herons, so the nankeen term has been dropped. But the pied heron is a day feeder, and catching prey is totally dependent on good light. The sight of herons has to be good to adjust for the refractive index as the bird looks underwater to catch fish. But the king of vision with the day herons is the reef heron. And in Australia we have the eastern reef heron. In contrast to the herons that we've looked at so far, this heron is found more on the coastal areas amongst the rock pools, but it also goes into the mangroves. With its shorter legs, it is ideal for hunting amongst the mangroves. This is where the long-legged herons have difficulty. The traditional name is sacred heron, coming from its binomial name, Egretta sacra. And some call it a heron and some call it an egret. And today I have grouped it with the herons. This eastern reef egret is quite dark, but there is also a pale bird called a pale morphology eastern reef egret. And this morphology is not just breeding plumage, it is a distinctive leucistic change. Now watch the vision of this bird. It sees a fish in a wave, approximately two metres away. And taking a leap, it simply catches that fish. Amazing vision. That ends this video of the herons. We haven't touched the egrets yet. These beautiful white birds will be portrayed in another video from the Plumes of Oz. If you subscribe to the channel, you will be notified of our next release of Australian Birds in the Wild.